Let's pray a thank you, shall we? Father, we do come this morning and thank you for your son. And Lord Jesus, we, Friday evening we sit and we read your word and go over what you went through that day on the cross. The time leading up to the time on the cross. But today is a day of victory, and we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have risen from the dead, you have taken away our sins, and today as a group we want to say thank you to you. Amen. You know, I've had some um, reminders that it is Easter this morning. How many of you guys had reminders besides this, that uh, today is Easter? Anybody else have any special reminders? I grabbed my phone this morning, and that was about, it wasn't real early, it was like 7 o'clock, and there's a text on there, and it's from Dominic at 12.30 a.m. Tammy's shaking her head. She got one, too. Dominic must have got off work, and he was the first one to say, Happy Easter to me, and I said, Same to you, and then I wrote, It's not about a bunny, and I put an exclamation mark, all right? <laughs> it's not about a bunny. That's my slogan for today, okay? And so then later on this morning, um, just a back up a little bit from Friday, my daughters were home, Lene's birthday, and we also wanted to do kind of a good Friday, just remember the day, just, it's not a normal day, it's the day Christ was crucified, we want to remember that, so we have kind of a good Friday uh, breakfast, Julie did a reading, and then Rebecca goes just a little bit further, and she's got her own way of celebrating things, so she starts on Easter early, and so before she went to bed, she went and stashed Easter eggs throughout the house, so that evening when I went out to feed the calf I think they were gone by then Friday evening put my hat on and I felt something and I pull it out and here's an Easter egg with a couple pieces of candy in it and then later on um, we go to bed and I crawled into bed and I felt something crunch and I thought what in the world and I reached over here's another plastic egg and throughout the last couple days as we there's a I look as we come down the hallway steps there's a, an egg sitting she's desecrated my dear antlers there's an egg up there on the <laughs> I put my pants on last night to go out, and there was one in the pocket. I got up this morning, and where was it this morning? Oh, yeah, I went to put my shoes on, and there was one stuck in my shoe. I found another one. We went to brush my teeth. You know, these eggs keep pounding. But I had one more even after that. Uh, you know, I got to pick up the rolls this morning. And just to have you know, I picked up two boxes of custard-filled Bismarcks, because when you pick them up, you can get your favorite. So I picked up two boxes along with the other ones. And so I'm carrying these boxes out, and it's kind of a handful, so I get to the door, I'm thinking, all right, so I turn them back into it. And as I'm, a lady, I hear a voice behind, kind of as I'm turning, a lady's voice says, here, I can get the door for you. And I said, oh, that's all right, thanks, I got it. And she said, happy Easter. Now, I don't know who this lady was, but it was, it kind of caught me off guard, and I, I kind of wanted to ask this lady, are you a Christian? Because if you're a Christian, we celebrate a different kind of Easter than the rest of the world. For some of them, it's about a bunny that lays eggs, right? Uh, but it's, for us, it's way more than that. And I'm going to share with you this morning three resurrections, okay? And so if you would take your Bibles and work your way to John chapter 11. Pastor Russ spoke on this not that long ago. I'm going to give you some sort of a recap. I'm going to jump over some of it, kind of tell it my own words, try to be true to the text, and then we're going to go on to, but this would be the first resurrection, okay? Um, and this is the resurrection of Lazarus. And just to get into, you know, without reading the first few verses there, Jesus is, um, has been out preaching, and it's one of those days, and I don't know if you call it a normal day for Jesus, but he's preaching, maybe throwing in a few miracles, and a messenger comes to, uh, to Jesus and says, Hey, your friend Lazarus is really sick. And I taught this at the jail. I said, you know, what kind of sickness can that be? You know, they knew it was not just a runny nose. Ha, 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 got a bad cough, you know. Maybe it's appendicitis. I mean, that's one thing. They probably had some clue that they maybe didn't know how to fix it. But they, you know, maybe something like that. And maybe it was a bacterial that was just really severe. Maybe it was, it had already gotten to him so bad he was down. But they know it's, it's serious. And so they give him this urgent message. Says, Jesus, you need to come because Lazarus is really sick. And it's a pretty good jaunt. I'm, from the, what I can guess on the map, maybe 50, 60 miles to come back to Lazarus. But they figured it was worth the trip. So what does Jesus do? He dilly-dallies around. You know, I don't know what, I don't know if he just, you know how some people, you tell them something, they say, oh, 
You know, I don't know if he did that or if he said, you know, asked him a few questions, but he goes back to preaching. And they go to bed that night. And the next morning, instead of getting up and packing his stuff, he goes back to preaching some more. And it must have come about in the conversation. And Jesus said, you know, this sickness is not unto death. He's not going to die. And yet when you read ahead, as you, in, the, in, the, in the verses that follow, the, again, the subject kind of comes around and he gets in, again, and he says, Lazarus has fallen asleep. And the disciples say, well, that must be good, because if he's sick, he's gone to sleep, he must be resting, his body is healing, and he's getting better. And then Jesus says very clearly, Lazarus is dead. And then he says something that's very interesting. Look, read down there in verse 14. And so he told them very plainly, he said, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. i got to ask you guys a question this morning. What would have happened if Jesus would have just hustled right up, got over there? You mean he, I don't know how he would get there 60 miles on foot, or if he would have got a horse, or what he would have done. What do you think, if he could have made it there in time, what would have happened? From you, what do you think would have happened if he got there in time? He'd have already healed him. You know, they had faith. Did you read ahead? They had incredible faith in Jesus. And Jesus had a real tight bond with this is a man of God. I think Jesus would have healed him. But Jesus says, I'm glad that I was not there because I got something to teach you folks. And so you go fast forward in the story just a little bit more. And they travel the 50, 60, or whatever, how many miles it is, and they get there. And just outside, this, the, as they're coming to the outside the home of, of Lazarus and Mary and Martha, and Martha hears he's coming. And I think there must be kind of an entourage of people because he's not moving real fast. In other words, the message gets her, Jesus is coming, and she has time to leave the house, come back out. And she says, oh, Jesus, if you had been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. And then she throws in something that really kind of shows her faith, right? She says, but I know God will give you whatever you ask. So what do you think she was wanting Jesus to do? Yeah, way more. Jesus, at this point, from what we can read in Scripture, has really only healed two other people, and it's been kind of obscure. You don't, a lot of people, a lot of, not a lot of people saw it happen. Okay? And so she's got this faith. She says, you know what, Jesus... She doesn't say it out loud, but she's thinking, if you ask God, he might bring him back. And then Jesus, and here's kind of the part that I want to teach you. This is the lesson for this resurrection, and it's the lesson that I want to get for you today. Tom, do you want to, you know what, Maybe let's just hold them slips of paper till later. We'll hold this a little bit. Let's just stick with the moment here. Get your Bibles there. Look there what he, what he says. Jesus says in verse 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he will rise again at the resurrection at the last day. So there, she's talking about, you know, there's going to be a time when Jesus will call the dead from the grave. She says, I know the dead are going to rise again, right? And then Jesus goes a little bit further, and he starts to teach his lesson. He says, Jesus said to her, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? What's Jesus telling Martha? He says, I'm the one that's going to raise people from the dead. He says, I'm the resurrection. I'm the life. And he says, there's two things. We're going to get this a little bit more. He says, he who lives in me, he who believes in me, even though he dies, he will come back to life. Now, they don't know where this is going to go, okay? And Je it does, Jesus doesn't give any more explanation really beyond that point. But she goes and she says, I'm going to go get Mary. So she runs off to Mary and says, Mary, you got to come. Jesus is here. He's just outside here. And he's asking for you. And so Mary comes out. And Jesus, when he sees her and sees her sad, she's crying. And it, it moves Jesus. And so it's, you get the shortest verse of the Bible. John eleven thirty five 35 says, Jesus wept. He's moved with compassion for her sorrow. And then he says, where's Lazarus buried? Let's go to the grave. And so the folks that are there at the house with Mary, 
Remember, this was a few days after the funeral, but they did their funerals kind of long, drawn out, kind of a long mourning process. The folks that were at the house, they kind of join up with, they see Mary and say, well, she's going to the tomb, let's go with. And so the whole entourage, the people that came with Jesus, the people that came with Mary, the friends that are hanging around, they go to the grave. And then Jesus says, pull back the stone. Okay? And Martha is kind of the common sense person in the family. And she says, ah, ah. He stinks. He's been dead for four days. He's, he's not going to smell good. Let me ask you a question. Did Lazarus stink? How many think Lazarus stunk when they pulled back the stone? You know what? When you die, the decay process starts right now. From my bat, when my past, when my son Leland was killed, we had laid him on the yard on a, on a little blanket out there in the yard. And it was a couple hours later when it was time to, for the undertaker to take him. And I wanted one more time to pick him up and just to feel his body. And I'm thinking this warm little body that was soft in my arms, and I could just envision that. I knew it was going to be my last chance. And so I reached around and picked him up to lay him on the stretcher. And you know, by that time, he was already cold. And his body was stiff. And as the process goes on, that happens to every person that dies. Your body cools down, your eyes start to dry out, and you just start to break down. So as your blood comes to the surface, you get this kind of mottled look to you. And that, would have, and that would have happened to Lazarus. And the process would have gone on normally with Lazarus. Okay? And after four days, Martha was very right. When they pulled that stone, stone back, he wasn't just in a coma. No, he'd been dead for four days. And there would have been a smell. It's the air from the outside the tomb, or out, out in the open there, rolled down into the tomb. What The air that was inside would have started coming back out. And the people would have started to step back and some of the more polite ones would just try to breathe through their mouth. The more kids would plug their nose, you know. Okay. And so Jesus, Jesus at that point prays. And he says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here. That they may believe that you sent me. He wants them to know that indeed he's the resurrection and that he's the life. That's what he wants them to know in this situation. And then he says, Lazarus, come forth. And I think if there was people crying in the audience, if there's any whispers, all of a sudden everybody gets really quiet. And they start looking into the tomb, into the darkness, and they hear a rustle. Okay, now I got a quick something from the past. When my girls were, my sisters were in Awanas, they, they did this one with toilet paper. Okay, and so someone had to be like, it was a girl, but they had her dressed up like Lazarus, and so they go round and round and round them and wrap them with toilet paper, you know. The reality is, they probably wrap one leg at a time, one arm at a time, you know. So when Jesus calls Lazarus, he rolls off the stone bed that he is lying on, and I don't know, his eyes are covered, his head is wrapped, so I don't know if he can grasp any light through his eyes, or if he's going by sound, but he heads for the door. And he walks out. And I'm sure it's just silence for a moment. And they grab and they start to pull. And as they realize he's alive, what happens? It's like a kid at Christmas time, I'm sure. The rag, they can't get the wraps off fast enough. And, they, and Lazarus has risen from the dead. What do you think Lazarus said? Where am I? <laughs> it was his resurrection party right there. And that's where the story kind of ends. And this happens, and I looked at this, I remember reading this uh, probably in the last year or two, and I realized the timing of this, because do you know when this happened in Jesus' life, if you could have had a timeline? This is very close to the time of Jesus' crucifixion and his resurrection. Why then? Because Jesus is trying to make a point that he is the resurrection, he is the one that gives life. And as and you follow that chapter into chapter 12, the Jews get concerned. They said, so many people believe. As they see, I'm, I'm sure from that group that were standing at the tomb there with Lazarus' tomb, once they realized Lazarus arrived, alive, some of the younger spry guys like Brady, they, if they had a friend that they knew that was a good friends with Lazarus, they probably ran over there and said, they just left and they're running. Hey, and they ran the whole way and said, Lazarus is alive. He came back from the dead. And the word spread. And so it says, as you go into the next chapter, it's just a short time later, 
that they're going to have a celebration, kind of a thank you dinner for Jesus. And that's where Mary comes and pours the perfume. She breaks out her bank account and buys some really expensive perfume to put on Jesus. And as people come, the people want to see Jesus because he's a miracle worker too, right? But they also want to see Lazarus. Because some of them, it's close enough to that time. Some of them have not yet seen Lazarus. And that's how you know it's close to the time of the cross. But again, there's a point to be made. Jesus is trying to teach them a lesson. He wants them to know that he is the one that will raise you from the dead. He is the one that will give you life. And so fast forward then to the second resurrection. And that's the one of Jesus, okay? There's the time of the cross. We celebrated again that on Friday, Friday night. We talked about that. Um, there's the betrayal by Judas. There's the trial. Um, and just all the, have the beatings. They go to the cross. And I want to say this, okay? I'm thinking that when they arrested Jesus that night, there probably wasn't a real large group of people that came. Maybe if I were to pick a number and guess, was there 50? Maybe 100. I would doubt if there was that many. But the group that came and arrested at Jesus was probably not very big. Okay? But as the, the words, same way, the disciples get scared and they split, and they didn't just go right to bed. I'm sure they would knock on someone's door and say, hey, they just arrested Jesus. And as the, night, the early morning flows full, full on and they're having this trial, word's going around the city, and people maybe that had been healed by Jesus, word gets to them, and they want to see what's going down. And so the group grows, and people start going to go and see what's going on. And they get to the cross where Jesus is. And I think by that time, it's not just 50 or 60 people. There's probably hundreds, maybe far beyond that, standing there looking at Jesus. And they watch, and a lot of them expect Jesus, he's not going to let this happen, but what happens? Jesus does nothing, and he dies. He gives up his spirit. And I looked a little bit into that time of the cross where Jesus is hanging there. And that it's a, it's a, we talked about this last week, and how as the day comes to an end, the Jews knew that he's carrying a sin and a curse. Well, they, don't, they know that the, the, the thieves, anyway, are carrying a sin and a curse on them. They don't understand. But the rule is that as God looks down on the earth, he sees the sin and the curse. And you're not supposed to leave a, per a body hang out, out on display on a cross or on a tree until nightfall. Otherwise, you will bring a curse on your land. So the Jews knew they had to hurry this up. And so they go to break the legs of the thieves and of Jesus. They break the legs of the thieves. But when they get to Jesus, what do they see? The soldier that's supposed to do it, he looks at Jesus and he realizes that he is already dead. And so he takes his spear and he sticks Jesus up into the ribs. And it says blood and water came out. And I, I went to see the significance of that this last week. And the, the people that's supposed to know say there's one, that means one of two things. You know how when you get a bad cut or a big scrape and you bandage it over and there's this clear liquid that kind of it when it's first there it's bright clear blood right okay and then as time goes on you see this the blood kind of separate and you get this clear like juice what's what's the right name sarah <laughs> there you have it right there ask sarah okay but maybe but at jesus it's the obvious it's, well, it's one of two things. Either his blood, he's been dead long enough that the blood has started to separate in his system, and that's why you have water and blood. It's either that option, or the other one is they say there's a sack of like clear fluid or by your heart, okay? And they said when he stuck up through Jesus' side, he pierced either his heart or into that sack, and that's where you got the clear fluid. Regardless of which of those it is, Everybody knows, everybody that's viewing the cross knows that Jesus has died. And so they go to bed that night. And for those who believe in the Lord Jesus and love him, they're thinking, this is the end. And the crazy thing is about this, as I study this, the people that believe in Jesus and the people know are the strongest ones not to believe in a resurrection. You would think they would have been the ones that's thinking that Jesus is going to resurrect, right? But they're the one, there's no talk of resurrection. Nowhere in scripture do you find any of his disciples, any of the women that follow Jesus, no one saying, well, he might just come alive again. But you know where you see that from? You see it from the leaders of the Jews. The ones who had said, let's crucify him. 
And they go to bed that night, and they're laying there in bed thinking about, the, did we get the job done? And they must have had a huddle the next morning because they get together, and they decide, we better go to the governor and ask for a guard because Jesus, see, they've seen three things. They've seen the miracles of Jesus. They've seen Lazarus. They've, they haven't lost, they caught the lesson of Lazarus really well. Okay? And the third thing is, they even listened to the teaching of Jesus, and they knew that Jesus said that he would rise again on the third day. And so in their minds, they're thinking they got a red circle around day number three, and they're thinking, we got to get past the third day. Or if we can get past that, we know we've got the job done. And so they asked for this entourage, or for this, this, I don't know what you call it, squad of soldiers, to go. They said, they tell this to, to um, the governor, and they asked the governor, can we have it? They said, Jesus has said that he would rise again on the third day, and we're afraid his disciples might steal the body. Can we have some soldiers to guard the tomb? And to be honest with you, I'm sure in their minds they're wondering if it was more than just the disciples. And so these soldiers that guard the tomb have two objectives there. One is to keep the, keep the disciples from stealing the body of Jesus, right? That probably wasn't real likely. What's the second one? No one says it. But in their mind, and I think in the minds of these Jewish leaders, they're thinking, if he does actually come out of the tomb on the third day, they're going to wrestle him down and use whatever force necessary to put him back in that tomb. Let's go read in Matthew 18. Matthew 18. Howard got ahead of me here when he read Matthew 20. I'm going to start back actually at chapter 17 at the very end. Verse 62 on chapter 7, excuse me, 27. Chapter 27, verse 62. This is the, the Saturday of it, okay? It says the next day, that Saturday, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. So give an order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. We've got to make it to day three. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell people that he has been raised from the dead. And this last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go Make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the tomb and posting the guard. And here we get to the good part. It says on day 20, on chapter 28, after the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. Soldiers are probably all standing around there someplace. There was a violent earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone, and sat on it. And his appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. What's the guards' jobs? They're supposed to put Jesus back in the tomb, right? It says the guards were so afraid of him, afraid of the angel that opened the, the, the stone, that they shook him. And became like dead men. They fainted. And the angel said to the women who had come, Do not be afraid. For I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. And they'll go quickly and tell his disciples, He is risen from the dead. And he's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. I've got to read just a little bit more. And so as the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid and yet filled with joy, ran to tell his disciples. And suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him and clasped his feet and worshipped him. 
I think there was a lot more enthusiasm and excitement than what I just read that with. I think of Lazarus and the enthusiasm and the excitement that was there. I'm sure the sisters jumped on Lazarus and squeezed him, and I'm sure it was the same with these gals here. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers, go to Galilee, and there they will see me. If you remember, there was also an event too, the road to Emmaus. It says there was a couple people walking to this town called Emmaus. And as they're going there, Jesus shows up. But he does something. He pulls a little divine magic, if you want to call it that. Okay? And so as they're looking at Jesus, they're not recognizing. He does something so they don't really see who he is. But he goes and explains to them. And he teaches them. Remember what, what he, that lesson he taught Martha? I am the resurrection of life. He goes and explains the scriptures to them. And he explains to them, he is the one, he's the resurrection, he is the life, and how he fulfills the scripture. And so they, all of a sudden, at this point, their eyes start to understand, or their eyes are open, they begin to understand who Jesus is, and that he's the one that will give life. And all of a sudden, their mission in life, what they are supposed to do, the lesson they're supposed to teach the people around them, what that is. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He's the one that will give us life in the end. There's one more resurrection coming, and this one is really short. I won't spend a lot of time on it. Look over to Matthew chapter 5. Got to make sure my note fell out of my Bible here. You know, I'm thinking I got the wrong passage here. Excuse me, let's try another one. Hmm. Bear with me, I've got it written here someplace. Not believe I did not write it down. Um, does anybody know where Jesus says that uh, He's the one that will give life? Oh man, will be resurrected to life. Let's. Oh shoot, I'm thinking of that. That is where it should. That's one of them. We're going to go with yours, Julie, Judy. <laughs> Let's go to Matthew chapter four, 14. Jesus is 14, 6. Jesus says, I am the way. Excuse me, John 14, 6. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's a good verse. We're going to go with that one. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And so I want to bring you back to believe. There were two groups of people there that night after Jesus was crucified, right? There was the disciples. There were the women at the cross. There were those that loved the Lord Jesus. And they knew, they believed in Jesus, but they did not understand the resurrection. Okay? There was also the Pharisees. Okay, And so the Pharisees had heard the words of Jesus, but they did not, they did not follow Jesus. Jesus said, um, I am the resurrection and the life. Give me that verse. i got to go back. I'm losing my hand. Sorry about that. Yeah, John, Tom, hand out those. Well, I'm regrouping here. Grab me. Yeah, hand those slips. I would like you to take two of these, three of these slips per person, okay? It's John uh, 11.25. Man, sorry, one verse throws me off so bad. John 11.25. Get three for me, give three to each person, okay? Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? So there's two things. Did the Pharisees believe the words of Jesus? The reality is 
they kind of did. They knew that Jesus had had, had, in three days, said he would rise from the dead, right? They got that part. Did they live for Jesus, though? No, they're on a totally different page. Okay? And that is the discern, that's the dividing thing because they're today, and it could be in this group, and there are people in churches today that know that Jesus lived. There are people that know that he rose from the dead. And they will believe that in their head. But what happens in their life? They do not live for Jesus. It's Jesus said, whoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And if you look at the disciples' lives as they go forward from this point, they did not fear death. And they went with this message to the people around them. They went across. They went for the regions around their Jerusalem, Judea. They went outside the country of Israel. They went as far, way over like to Spain. They went to the east. Thomas, I think, went to India. And they took this message that Jesus has died for sins and that whosoever will live and believe in him will never die. What Tom is handing out to you is the gospel in two verses. And there's a reason that I have given you three of these. Because as, uh, what I'd like you to do is stick them in your pocket, in your Bible for the moment, but I'd like you to stick them in your vehicle when you get good time to leave here. Throw them on the dash, throw them in the cup holder. And the next time that you stop to get gas, take one of those, stick it on the gas pump. Or if you go into the grocery store, stick it on the shelf. Or someplace where you know someone's going to pick it up. Because that's the message we have. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He that liveth and believeth in him will never die. And he asked that question, do you believe this? If you believe it, take it with you, pass it out. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus and for his death and for the life that he gives us. And I think as we, even today as I run across people, I run into town there and I wonder how many of them know that Jesus died for sins, that it's not about a bunny, but it's about our Lord Jesus who has given us life. Bless your word from this pulpit and across the country and across the world where churches are, where your people gather and your word is preached today, that people would know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Thank you.